Welcome to the Q Agenda. Today on our Lively Gay Buzz Talk, we're talking about passing. What does that even mean exactly? We'll break it down. We have some fantastic breaking news. The Q Agenda is taking over the world, baby. We are going global as we join the fabulous digital platform, Revry. And Damian Bellicioni and Chris Rodriguez are here to talk about our future in the exciting new joint venture. And I sat down with telenovela superstar Litzy, who stopped by to tell us all about her new role as a lesbian on Manuel Paragalanes on Pantalla. All that and more right here on The, the Q, Q Agenda. Agenda. Passing can refer to a few different things. Generally speaking, it means being perceived by people and mainstream society as a cisgender and or heterosexual. Passing is not inherently good or bad. It can be an affirming experience for some people and a stressful negative source of pressure for others. Passing is a complicated topic, so let's talk about it. I feel that uh, when we talk about passing, it's just so many, it's, there's so many layers to it. Because I, it, yes, I am familiar with, you know, of course being, a, 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 you know, defining like cisgender people. And, but I feel that there's also like, for example, passing when you're Latino and you look white. Or when you are um, Afro-Latino and they just put you immediately in the box of, uh, African-American or black, or even when you're gay and somebody thinks you're straight or when you're straight and somebody, so, I mean, there's such a, like, like, little lines in between. I don't know, how do you ladies feel about it? I think the most important thing about this topic is that anyone who is passing, whether you are passing as cisgender, passing as white, whatever it is, is just, acknowledging that fact, knowing that you have that privilege, that way you can understand um, you know, how your experience is much different than someone who is a part of your community but doesn't have that same privilege as you. For me, for example, as a trans person, you know, a lot of people say that I pass as cisgender. So I am very aware of that fact and very aware of how my, that affects my experience compared to my trans brothers and sisters who might not be quote unquote passing. The other thing is also understanding the amount of pressure that society puts on passing on, you know, passing for whatever it is that society thinks you should look or be like. Um, you know, again, for trans people, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to look a certain way so that we can pass. And it's not because we're not part of who we are, but we do understand how much easier it makes it for us in our everyday lives to be able to walk down the street and not have someone, you know, yell a derogatory term because they right away see that we are trans. Um, we would love to not have to pass. We shouldn't have to pass. But unfortunately, we're still in a society where people just want you to be the image of what they think, you know, is right for you, even if they're not even a part of your community. You know, I never forget when we first started shooting our show in season one, and I remember Liana sharing a story about being a kid and somebody calling you a lesbian. And I was surprised about how familiar that story was to me because they used to also call me, you know, like the gay guy or, you know, the F word, which I, I'm not gonna say, but um, fancy. I, 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 fancy. Fabulous. <laughs> uh, just, um, it, 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 I immediately connected to you in that way. Um, how did you feel about it and, and how do you think it affected your life as an adult? Like not being able to pass as a, like a straight person? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know because like there's layers, right? Like there's layers of, we have like a patriarchal heteronormative society that um, sort of says uh, more mask, rewards more masculine um, people in terms of like, we listen to men, we allow men to take up space. Um, and I always kind of wonder if I, as a butch presenting woman, get away with things that a femme presenting woman can't in terms of how direct I am or um, how I carry myself. Um, they just think, you know, the world just sort of views it as, oh, that's, she's sort of like a dude. And so does that mean that I get some privilege in that? Uh, so yeah, I don't know what it's like to not look like a lesbian. I mean, does, does this look like a lesbian? Does this look <laughs> like a lesbian? But that's the thing, like, what does a lesbian look like? <laughs> exactly. a le 
lesbian can be anybody. Uh oh, and how many times have I been wrong about, oh, that's a lesbian? Well, and no, nope, they just owned a farm. <laughs> you don't know. You don't these people in the we Midwest. We come in all flavors, colors, sizes, and, and I also, you know, to me, it bothers me, for example, when sometimes my husband's name is Danny and mine is Enrique. And sometimes, because he's darker than me, they think he's Enrique and I am Danny. Mm -hmm. So here I'm passing for a white person. You have no idea how many times people have said horrible things in Spanish next to me, thinking that I will never understand what they're saying. And I just turn around and be like, ¿Qué es lo que estás diciendo? ¿Qué es lo que te pasa? And they turn pale. Wow, I wish I had that superpower. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I think it's just a matter of educating people that we, again, come in all shapes, forms, and sizes, and it's a matter of respect. Just respect yes, each other. Yes, respectful. There is so much more we can add to this topic, but we have to take a quick break, and when we come back, Damien and Chris from Red Free are joining us. Reverie is a global streaming network launched in 2016 that focuses on queer content and queer creators. And we are so happy to report that the Q Agenda is joining the Reverie family and it will be available to stream. So here to talk about our new adventure are Reverie co-founders, Damian Pelliccioni and Christopher Rodriguez. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Welcome, guys. Oh, thank you so much for having us. This is such a treat. <laughs> We're yes, so excited to, to sort of uh, hit all of who your audience encompasses. Why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about what Reverie is, and so we can start from there. Yeah, so Reverie is the world's first and largest LGBTQ global streaming television network. We're currently in over 250 million homes, and we've been downloaded in over 130 countries now globally, and you can find us on virtually any device that you have at home. Oh my gosh, did you say 250 million? Yes. I gotta, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, look, the biggest thing for us is that Reverie's global, right? We didn't, uh, when we first started the company, we didn't want to restrict ourselves from being only here in the United States. You know. Uh, we want to amplify and create a platform for queer voices, authentic stories to be seen and heard across the globe. Because let's face it, um, you know, there are countries in this world that need to see themselves represented and reflected on screen. And no matter your gender identity, your sexual orientation, your culture, your language, your walk of life, you know, we have something on this platform that reflects everything within queer culture. I think that's awesome. And like what I love most about Rev Free is the fact that it's not just diverse and inclusive content, but the creators behind it. Because all these other platforms, yes, they'll have some, you know, diverse and inclusive programming, but I'm always going into watching it with like, oh, I don't know about this, because, <laughs> you know, anytime they try to tell our stories, but not from a place of being a part of our community, they usually miss the mark. But with Reverie, it's people from our community also creating these stories. And that's what I love about it. And it's also for that community. You know, there's there are LGBTQ characters Characters that are for mainstream audiences, and then there's LGBTQ characters that are for queer audiences. Mm -hmm. And that's, we have a lot of freedom because we're able to focus on this community and we can take a lot of chances and be very bold with our programming. So how did, how did you guys come up with this idea? <laughs> so this is a funny story. Uh, I am the biggest self-proclaimed Apple file. I love the culture and all of the products of Apple. And I was in Germany, actually, waiting to do a trade show in Amsterdam, working for a different company. And I was watching Tim Cook's speech on the new Apple television when it came out in 2015, the fourth generation one for tvOS, which is an operating system, essentially, for app developers to create a unique experience for the living room. And I immediately bought the Apple TV, went home, installed it, and I started searching, just like when you get a new iPhone, for LGBTQ apps, and nothing came up. We were actually wow. the first ever LGBTQ app uh, that launched on the Apple TV platform, and then we iterated into all other devices. That's so great, and I, I, I have to say, as a, a creator of content myself, uh, getting into mainstream rooms and pitching um, mostly white cis males uh, about my characters has been, you know, is, is like an extra hurdle that it sounds like you all are really trying to eliminate. 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, again, this is this is for our community, and we we can take these really amazing chances and tell stories that are beyond just the, you know the coming out stories. You know, people ask us a lot about the mainstreams, and I think it's wonderful that there's a lot of representation now across the board. Um, it seems like every you know mainstream streaming network has to have a show that focuses on the queer community to some extent or has a character, but we have the freedom to actually be able to talk about issues that are that are beyond just coming out. Um, and this is what a lot of are the amazing creators that are in our network, um, these ideas that they pitch us, and then we're able to distribute them globally um, to audiences that need to hear them. And I think what's really unique is, you know, our mission here is that we believe that representation saves lives. And we believe that it starts from leadership. Uh, Chris and I are only 50% of the co-founders of Reverie. There's two other co-founders, Aaliyah J. Daniels, uh, who is our COO and just a super ally to our community, but she knows what it is to be marginalized as a woman of color. And then LaShawn McGee, who is part of the queer community, an Army veteran, and our chief product officer. So we're 75% people of color founded, 20% or 50% women of color founded, and 75% queer. And I don't know if it counts, but I am an immigrant from Canada. <laughs> In other words, ain't nobody calling you out anytime soon because <laughs> you got right. all the boards covered. We, yeah, and it, it was authentic. You know, we were all friends and we worked together before. Aaliyah and Chris went to law school together, you know, and what I think is amazing is when you have a company that reflects the identity of the consumer from leadership, you really have no other place to go but up. And so, you know, culture for us is everything and we're trying, what we're hoping to do and what we are doing with Reverie is shaping what queer culture looks, sounds, walks, and talks like all across this globe. And you have, you're facing it in a new way because of the pandemic. Um, but we have to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more from Damien and Chris. And we are back with more from Damien and Chris from Reverie. All right, guys. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit more about the content that you offer, uh, some highlights, uh, and maybe how the pandemic is shaping how you do things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, coming from a content perspective, um, you know, we have a lot of really amazing um, licensed content um, that you can stream um, both live and on demand on the network. Uh, but we also have really amazing originals. Um, I'd like to point out one in particular that came out um, last fall. It's called The Category Is. This series is an anthology docu-series that focuses on the ballroom scene, so the, vog the voguing scene, um, but outside of the traditional areas that you would expect. So you expect Los Angeles, um, New York. But um, our series focuses on um, other uh, countries all around the world. So the first season is the category is Mexico City, and it's all Spanish language, it's all subtitled, and it's about this emerging ballroom scene that a lot of people didn't realize existed in Mexico. I did not know that either. Awesome. Neither did I, and I love Vogue. <laughs> I can't do it, but I love it. <laughs> okay, just try one. Just a little bit. <laughs> no, 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 no. Maybe so, after the show. Yeah. <laughs> how, how about the pandemic? Did you guys, you just had a virtual pride to sort of step up to the moment? Tell us about that. Yeah, so we had some really big um, events and launches this past Pride season in June. Um, you know, one of the biggest things is that we were very honored to um, do a 27-hour continuous live stream in every territory with the World Pride Organization, and that launched on all of our channels and our apps. And includes um, we have a we have actually have a VR app, so we had folks that could watch in virtual reality via our Litters, Lil Star channel on PlayStation. Wow, that is incredible. And how was that received? I mean, I mean you must have been just overwhelmed by the, the feedback for that. It was amazing. Um, it was it was it was so surreal to actually experience it because it was it was literally 27 hours, no commercials, and um, it was such a powerful moment because it was one of the first things that I'd seen um, that was really you know a, a post um, COVID environment um, where you know we wanted to be in person celebrating Pride together, but we were kind of forced in this um, situation. But it was actually very rewarding. Um, there was participation from like Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Betty Who performed, Adam Lambert. It was truly an amazing experience. Wow. Did you stay up the whole time? <laughs> uh, we stayed up for as long as we could. I think it would, you know, on, it started on a Friday at around like two or three o'clock in the afternoon here on the West Coast, and it lasted till Sunday at about like three or four o'clock in the morning. Um, and it was really cool because like we watched even, you know, Pablo Vittar in Brazil. They went from 
time zone to time zone to time zone. So like if it was prime time in Australia and it traveled all the way to prime time on the West Coast, it was truly phenomenal. And the organization that put it on, uh, the Global Pride organization are just amazing partners and we are so blessed and honored to work with them. That is amazing that Revy literally like connected the entire world during Pride when we couldn't be together. Yeah. Like that just to me is just, uh, I, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, I love and, pride. So. Well, don't. Hopefully, you'll, you'll tune in again next year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think even more of an honor is that the Q Agenda um, is officially joining your platform of streaming options. So, can you talk a little bit about how that came about and why you love us so much? <laughs> no, but really, me like, the, how did it come about? Well, we've been big fans of the show um, for as long as it's existed, and we were just happy to be able to um, to work this out um, and to help to expand the reach of this really amazing show, again, across the world and to all these diverse audiences. And, and I'd like to point out, too, it's not just um, queer audiences. You know, we have these really amazing, a big part of, the, of, of our network is we believe um, very much in live TV um, first. So we believe that it's the job of the network to curate to the audience, and um, that's a bit um, radical in today's world um, of on-demand, you know, Netflix and Hulu. Um, and it's really nice to be able to um, put your voice, what, what you want to say first for and forward on um, the network. And it's not just our network, it's also mainstream platforms. So you can find the Reverie channel on Zumo, on, T on TiVo Plus, on Stir, on the Roku channel, on Samsung TV Plus. Um, and a lot of, you know, mainstream audiences are really absorbing um, the message that we have um, to say and, and they're loving it. And I think one of the biggest things too um, is just the impact that we're having and we've seen this and I had the honor of being in Mumbai last June during Pride season. I actually was there right before World Pride New York and I was speaking at the Kashish Film Festival, the LGBTQ Film Festival and just for context, you know, in India they've only had their Stonewall moment two years ago in 2018 where they decriminalized it, what it is to be LGBTQ. Wow, that is incredible. We are so excited to be a part of the Bravery family now. Yes. We want to thank Damien and Chris for stopping by and for the best LGBTQ content including the Q agenda, don't forget to check out Ravri. When we come back, Enrique is talking to actress and telenovela superstar Lizzy, so don't go anywhere. She has starred on telenovelas like Pecadora, Made in Manhattan, and Al Otro Lado del Murro. But now she's taking on a new challenge, playing an LGBTQ character. Enrique caught up with Lizzy. Let's take a look. Well, I don't know about our viewers, but I am beyond excited to welcome Litzy to the Q Agenda. Litzy, how are you? Good. Let's talk a little bit about this new show. I am so excited to hear your perspective and your experience on Manuel Paragalanes. Tell me, for somebody who has not watched it, because I know it's available already, what can they expect? Well, it is a, a comedy, a romant romantic comedy, and it's very, very funny. It's hilarious. Like you, if if you watch it, you're gonna be laughing all the time. And um, and my character Mariana, it's so cool. Uh, it, it it's it's the first time that I represent um, a, a gay person. So for me, it's been a, an honor, and I feel so proud and so good uh, as as Mariana. And uh, and I'm 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 really happy that I that I can do this for all the people that always um, support my, my career as a singer, as an actress. Um, and that leads me right into my next question because we are super intrigued about your experience on playing Mariana and playing a member of our community. And we are beyond excited that you've decided, made the choice. You've always been a leading lady and now you're venturing into uh, playing an LGBTQ character. You're an ally, we all know that very well. But what was it like and where did you tap into yourself to play Mariana with like you've done with so much dignity? At the beginning, I was like, oh, OK, this is amazing. This is going to be a huge, um, como se dice, reto. Uh -huh. A challenge. And challenge. And, uh, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I want to, to do it with, with dignity, with, with, with honor, with pride. And I was like, and it, it has to be to be very different from, from the other characters that I've done before. And this was my, my first project outside Telemundo. So 
for me was perfect, you know, like a comedy and a, and a, and a gay character. So uh, I, I wanted to put in Mariana a lot of authenticity, a lot of realness, a lot of uh, freshness, you know, and, uh, and a lot of freedom. I, I wanted Mariana to be so free that that people just to say okay mariana is there mariana is gay mariana is uh conquering um uh girls and and everything is fine and everything is it's, it's going well for her you know i love that i think that that is so key because um that kind of also then to tag along onto that is we're used to seeing in the Latino entertainment industry the representation of LGBTQ characters be very stereotypical and you did not take that route at all. Are no. we making leaps and bounds? Are we starting conversations that were not being had before? Where do you think we're at and where do you see the future in the Hispanic entertainment? in regards to representation of LGBTQ characters? I think it is very important to putting these uh, characters in, in all the, the projects. Like, I don't like the hashtag love is love and the, the pride month. Like, I, I would love to be like, we are all human beings and that's it. Of course, we are going to support it. Of course, we're going to fight and we're, of course, we're gonna do a lot of stuff to to keep, you know, putting everyone up and, and, and being happy because we all want to be happy. So I think it's very important to keep doing this type of uh, stories and characters with no uh, taboo, yeah. tabúes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like Mariana, you know, that is there. She just uh, says, you know, uh, I'm, I'm gay and I'm going to try to find my, my partner and that's it and everything goes perfect. I think that there's no better way to wrap this interview. Thank you so much. It's based on honesty and, and thank you for sharing that with us. I feel like this is just gonna be a beginning of a monumental amount of opportunities that are coming your way for lending oh, your voice you. to really, really representing the community with so much dignity and so much honor and so openly. So I wanna thank you for that and thank you for stopping by the Q Agenda, Litsi. We want to thank Litsi for chatting with us. For more on Manuel Paragalanes, check out Pantalla. And for more on us, don't forget to visit LATV.com. We'll see you next time.